and uh, I think we'll begin our next session. Okay, so let's start off one more time with a prayer. In the name of the Father and the Spirit. So with all these questions that we have, taking God's mercy for granted, uh, forgiving, to understand how much what we think is not necessarily the way God thinks, or our way of being like God, this transcendence, this eminence of God, this is exactly what the Gnosticism heresy is going to deny. The Gnosticism heresy is going to say that we can understand God that our thoughts are adequate to God's thoughts and control God's thoughts and, and are able to contain God's thoughts, that our ways are God's ways. And so, as we'll see later with Pope Francis, the Gnostic heresy will domesticate the mystery of God and in some ways humanize God to our level, making God a God that we use to our own needs instead of understanding that God infinitely transcends us, that His ways, as much as the heavens are above the earth, His ways are above our ways, His thoughts above our thoughts. And so this is a very interesting uh, introduction, first introduction for us to see that there is an important poverty of spirit that the Gnostic heresy wants to rob of us, and therefore rob us of access to true happiness, of access to all of the other Beatitudes. The Beatitude poverty of spirit is the door entry to the other Beatitudes. What is the door entry to all of the sacramental life? What is the door through which we all have to go through to have access to the sacraments? Baptism. What is the doorway to the, all the months of the year. But if you don't go through this month, you can't go through any of the other months. January. Interesting, January, you take the first words, J-A-N-U-A-R, Yanwar, what does that mean in Latin? Door. January is door month. It's the door to the rest of the year. If you don't go through January, you can't get through the rest of the year. If you don't go through the door of baptism, you can't make it to the other sacraments. If you don't go through the doorway of poverty of spirit, you can't get to the other beatitudes. So how important that request, that supplication, Lord, give me poverty of spirit, and to acknowledge how much His ways are above my ways. And then this last little saying, this little quote, that I think is very beautiful, it's different from the others because it's not a request, but a witness to the fruits of the Holy Spirit working to bring about unity in the minds and intentions of the early believers. Who would be able to read that for us who hasn't had a chance to read so far? Anyone? Yes, please. Okay, 
So we have what seems to be, it might seem a bit idealized, but what I think is beautiful is that there's no sense of competition, there's no division, there's the goodwill of each and every one that is put forth, there's the desire to give rather than to receive. And we see that they're of one heart and one soul. The Hebrew word heart surprisingly refers to the intellectual side of our character. And the soul is the emotional aspect. But in any case, what is underscored is that full unity that brings. And if there is one heart, what does that mean about that heart? If there is one heart, it means that the heart of each person is not hardened. Because what is one of the immediate consequences of a hardened heart? I can't, I'm closed, and I can't become one with another person. Impossible. The heart is hardened. That's one of the immediate consequences of a hardened heart. And so I cannot come into contact with another person. And it means when there is one heart, that there is truly a heart of flesh. There's none that's replaced the heart of stone. And that unity of heart means that there's more concern for others than for myself. And so our quest for holiness and for unity also requires a certain quality of selflessness. Can you say that with me? Selflessness. I hope it's an English word. If not, I just made it up. And they ever did see the movie called Saving Mr. Banks? A very funny movie. And they, they have the word of um, uh, the constant goal is Swanstable. And she says, Swanstable's not a word. And they say, We made it up. And then PJ Trevor says, Well, I'm making it up. <laughs> anyway, I just made up words. If, it's, if it isn't made up words, selflessness. And so there's a singularity of purpose, a singularity of mind that sets this moment in the church apart, that becomes a model. Even though it might seem far from what we live, but we can have this sort of unity because we're told by the angel Gabriel that nothing is impossible for God. And so, we have that promise of Christ to be one flock and one shepherd. And this is something that inhabits the heart of your pastor, Father Vincent, that we all be one, that we be holy. And that's what the Lord wants for us. And so we can ask, okay, Lord, we want this. Let us help to desire this. But we do have challenges. And as any challenge, as any obstacle, as any tactic of our adversary, one of the things that he plays upon is our ignorance. So this next part of our time together is so that we can understand some of the challenges, some of the obstacles that are at work. Not to dwell in them, not to delve in them, into them but to be aware so we may better avoid them and be evangelizers out of those types of obstacles. So we're going to now look at some of the challenges to unity. And this will be the shift from the modern to the post-modern world. Now this becomes, this is quite a, it's rather simple, but I think it's also rather enlightening, at least it was for me, and this, I can't take any credit for it, it was from a class that I took this summer, um, Spiritual Theology from the Pontifical University of Mexico City, and so I think that it's quite interesting, some of these challenges that we have. So, as I said, in the last few decades, we have experienced the transition from the modern to the post-modern society. Now, I didn't even know that, I didn't really know much about these words until then. But I think that this helps us to situate the importance of this mission by looking at the context that we're living in right now. So, in the modern world, we're going to take a look at the differences between the modern and the post-modern world. In the modern world, one of the driving assets was reality. And reality, making the world a better place, working with what it is, transforming the world, 
Uh, and using matter basically to transform, you know, transform the world by our work. So it implied work, it implied labor, it implied making the world a better place for tomorrow. Reality that is from the modern world in the postmodern world has been replaced by something that you all know, but we haven't thought of. Perhaps it's been replaced by virtuality. How many of you have seen people playing on what they call virtual reality games and things like that? Virtuality. I've been astounded and not much shocked, personally, at the impact of video games. I was at someone's house, there was a grown man, 45 years old, playing on a video game that was this war game, and I just used to watch it, look at this game, and I watched it for maybe 30 seconds, and I just was horrified, because you saw it with like real people that he's killing them, and you see the blood gushing, you see, you know, it's, it's so real that it looks like it's the real thing. And then I was reflecting with someone, why are we having this instance, like what took place in Uvalde a few months ago, no, all this not too far from Laredo, it's in a quiet, a quaint town, peaceful town, that's forever marked now. No one will ever associate with the Valde, what happened in the Valde. The people from the Valde said that the person that did this isn't even from the Valde, they moved here a few months ago. But what is interesting is that because of this shift from reality to virtual reality, I wonder if it's not that people are not able to distinguish the difference. And it's not just about it was San Antonio, uh, I believe there was something years ago, and then Waco, there was uh, in Colorado, some local I can't remember. In Nice, in France, in Paris, in France, it's all over. This sort of frenzy of just killing people for a very strange reason, for not really knowing. And I think that the video games, this virtuality, gives a certain pleasure of being almighty, all-powerful. And even in some of these virtual reality games, you have several lives, you come back to life. So it doesn't mean if you die, you come back to life. And so I think that this shift from reality to virtuality is a very important aspect of this postmodern world. Next, we're going to take a look at another aspect. In the modern world, one of the operative elements was duty. Much to my chagrin, two days ago, Queen Elizabeth II passed away. I had a huge, I still do have a huge admiration of her. When I was in London one time, I went to the London Tower where they have the video of her coronation ceremony. I was with another brother, and I said, when we're done watching, I said, let me go watch it one more time. I said, oh, okay. So I watched the second time. Then after the second time, I said, Brother, I have one desire. You want to watch it again? I said, yes. And so it was amazing because she's, she is crowned and she is clothed as the high priest. She has the, the orb and she has the scepter. But what Queen Elizabeth did, and you can agree or disagree with that, that's not my point. She always said for the rest of her 70 years that she was crowned queen. She would always refer, saying, when I made my coronation vows, Queen Elizabeth lived for 70 years a publicly vowed life. She understood the importance of her duty, and people thought that she had no power. Every piece of legislation in the United Kingdom went through her desk and could not go to Parliament until she had let it go. And she would say, This law was tried in 1947. Why don't you ask Sir Wendell what he thinks about this? Or this was a situation back in 1988, and we had this solution. Why don't we reflect it? So she would oblige Parliament to have to look at many a law in a different way. So she had amazing power. It wasn't the power of legislative, it was what you call moral authority. And so Queen Elizabeth was the epitome of someone who realized that there was duty. Duty to her country. Duty to make the world a better place. That's the modern world. The postmodern world, duty has been replaced with this. Pleasure. We are to 
pursue pleasure. And all of our media and Amazon to that are in the pursuit of pleasure. And so instead of looking for what one ought to do, it's what I feel like doing. And that has been a great operative element of marketing to tap into that desire of pleasure. And so we have to be aware of that. How many of you have ever gone onto the internet and ended up buying something you never thought you were going to buy? Or you go to the store and just before the checkout counter, all those cookies look really good, but they weren't on the shop list, but who cares? It's only $2.88, so you put it on in. That appeal to pleasure. It's amazing how much we are able to have ourselves be sort of uh, turned into that matter of that idea of pleasure. Let's say, I don't know if you know about Greek mythology, there was a man named Prometheus. Prometheus, what did Prometheus do? He was a god, and he gave, he thought that mankind would be better off if he gave the gift of fire. So he gave the gift of fire to humankind, and then he was banished as a god. But he wanted to make the world a better place. So it was this idea of, I want to make the world a better place through our duty. Instead of duty, we got pleasure. So Dionysus, the god of pleasure, the god of drinking, the you know, Bacchus. So there's been this shift. We have let ourselves be turned into beings that pursue pleasure. And now you can see how natural evangelical it is because we can see many things in the gospel is what we ought to do. Father has in his house a saying from St. John Paul II saying, true freedom is not the ability to do what I want, but the possibility of doing what I ought. That's true freedom. And so our true freedom of doing what we ought is been replaced by the slavery and pursuing of pleasure. And the whole work I think that we used to have has been changed to just see how I can get more pleasure. And you see this on the internet, you see this on, on, in, in any type of advertising. So we change from a society of self-sacrifice to a society of self-absorption. Now, how has this been done? It hasn't been done just simply. It's been done over a certain process. So let's look at the next change. In the modern world, let's see if it's coming up. I guess I have to do it again. Okay, let's see if it comes up now. In the modern world, what would the modern world have started with? Some people say the modern world started with in 1450. What happened in 1450? I think this is very interesting. A man named Johannes Genfleisch Sir Laden zu Gutenberg. Can you say that five times over? Johannes Genfleisch zu Laden zu Gutenberg. He ushered in the modern world with the invention of the printing press in 1450. So throughout the modern world, the written word was the dominating form of communication. And even up until the pandemic, there were newspapers easily readily available. You could touch, you could feel, you could cut out articles, you could tear them out, you could save them, you could look at it again, you could crumple them up, make fire out of it. So, what has the written word, which appeals to our intellect, been replaced by? And here it comes. Hopefully, I'll hit it one more time. Don't know why it's doing this. The image. And the image appeals not to our intellect, but to our emotions. And what happened when we became, when we entered into the pandemic and that social distancing were all necessarily on social media, which is just a series of images. It's quite a different thing. People say, I read it using my candle. Well, when you're reading using your candle, you're just looking at images one after the other. It's different when you're reading using a piece of paper. There is something that is inherently different. You might say no, but it is different. There is a different use of my brain. I can highlight, I can come back, I can, I can dog ear, even though you're not supposed to. I can use a pencil, all sorts of stuff. There's a way in which it's more present to me. We have this in our community. There are brothers who do not want to carry their psalters around anymore, so they have their app on the phone. And it's convenient, but I think it's quite, quite different to pray using the psalter that's a paper psalter and turning the pages than to use a phone, because that's just continuing with the image aspect. 
And so we have this sh shift from the written word to the image. Now what's also very interesting is that in the modern world, the regulatory, regulatory element of the modern world was, come on up, was the state. The state would give laws, the state would regulate. It was the regulatory aspect of society, the state. How important the state was. However, in our postmodern world, it's not the state that is the regulatory element. What do you think it is? What regulates now society? It's not the state. Well, come up. It's the market. And it's the market that will oftentimes we'll say, we'll let the market decide, we'll let the market make the decision. The state is no longer able to make all these, to, to be the regulatory element. I find that it's just fascinating. One of the interesting changes as well is that in the modern world, we have what was called objective truth. This is true, and we all agree, this is true, this is not true. And we were able to, on the subjective truth, to build a structure of society with laws and with consequences, because we could say these are the objective truths that we have. Now what has happened is that in the postmodern society, there's no longer objective truth. We have come to have something else. It has been replaced by relativity. That's your truth, but it's not my truth. And since we can't agree on one truth, how can we come to agreement on other things? How can we make decisions? So there is this relativity that is taking place. And if everyone has their own truth, we'll see that everyone has their own ethics. Everyone has their own mode of behavior. And so we have a great difficulty in enforcing laws. We're going to see this in just a few moments. So objective truth is the replaced by saying truth is relative. And how many times have you heard that? That's your truth, that's not mine. Truth is relative. And so if truth is relative, when Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the light, that means Jesus is relative. It, relevant, it makes our religion relative. And so if you are saying there's one truth, you are a bigot. You are intolerant. You are, and you can put whatever word you, you want. And all you can say is, no, I'm just being Catholic. <laughs> but no, if we take away objective truth, we take away the foundation, of existence of religion. We take the foundation of religion, the foundation of our Catholic life. And that's one reason why so many of the Catholic services were eliminated. Under a certain presidential administration, Catholic child services, Catholic charities, which was adoption services, were eliminated from several states. Why? Yes, they wanted the ch children to go to heterosexual couples that were married. And the fact that not wanting that, they were eliminated out of civil states, one of them being Illinois. They could no longer exist. Because there is no longer any objective truth. And so if there's no longer objective truth, there's no reason for confrontation. Because it doesn't make anything move forward. There was a place for debate, there's a place for ideas being confronted because then we would come to a deeper understanding because we would confront them in light of objective truth. But if there's no objective truth, there's no need for confrontation. All we'll need to do is have this. Instead of confrontation, we just need to have consensus. And what is consensus? It means we're going to look for the least common denominator. And that's what is going to be. So that's why the state can't regulate things because we have no confrontation. It's just a sense of there's consensus. So it's much more efficient to let the market replace and take the lead. And you can't help but to see how true this is. 
by transparency. I don't know if you've ever had that experience, but I have sometimes been shocked when I look on um, Facebook to see the things that people are putting on there that are part of their personal, intimate life. And there was one case in Laredo, there was the brother of a woman whom I knew, and I called her, I called the sister up, and I said, your brother has put this picture of his wife on Facebook that I find he should be the only one seeing them. He should be putting this on Facebook for heaven's sakes. And so this idea that everyone has to know everything about everyone. And that if there's no sense, if you have intimacy, if you have say this is private, then you're hiding something. So this necessity of ultimate transparency, no more confrontation, but just transparency, that's one of the most highly uh, uh, valued qualities. And this has an effect in the family, at school, and in the workplace. And so, with this sort of, um, what would you say, everyone making up their own rules, we used to have laws for everyone. There used to be the same laws that were applied for everyone. But now, what we have, instead of laws for all, we, they're replaced by personal, personal ethics of making up your own rules. And I'd like to give just an example. This is just one example out of hundreds you can find. But about a year ago, I was very surprised as I was listening. The district attorney of San Francisco, I don't know what his name is, but he decided about a year ago that he would stop prosecuting certain crimes. Now that should already be an alert because the district attorney is not the one that decides what the laws are. He's supposed to enforce the laws. That's his job. It's not to say this is a law and that's not a law. So he's already out of his ballpark. So he decides not to prosecute certain laws, certain crimes. And he doesn't, so he makes up his own rules. And he said that anyone stealing less than $300 of merchandise out of any store would not be prosecuted. This is in San Francisco. So what was the result? Walgreens, CVS, uh, all these stores just closed. Because you had people coming in just doing $300, $250 of merchandise and they knew they wouldn't be prosecuted, so you couldn't continue to have business there. And so he made life of San Francisco much worse because all the convenience stores were closed. And if he does this on the little being the district attorney, what prevents other people from doing the same thing, just making up their own rules and not following what are the laws? And so what this leads to is this leads to a sense of insecurity in our cities, in our workplaces, but also this leads to emotional insecurity. Because if we have all of these sort of ethics and we're making up their own rules, what happens to relationships? And as we'll see, in the modern world, there was the emphasis on stability of relationships. You're married, that's for the rest of your life. You enter a religious community, that's what you're gonna do. And stability of relationships, if everyone has their own truth, everyone makes up their own rules, then in the postmodern world, instead of stability, it's replaced by easing in and out of relationships with relative ease. And so, what does that mean? That means that relationships are changed, they're made to change, there is no longer anything that is permanent, there's no longer the sense of commitment, there's no longer the sense of love, there's no longer the sense of self-sacrifice, of compromise, of confrontation, because there is no objective truth. So you have your truth, I have my truth, we'll just separate, it's much easier, we'll find someone else to hang around with for a while. So there is no sense of gift of self to the other, it's the other that is a sense, remember the primary word is no longer duty, but pleasure. So the relationship is in view of my pleasure. And once that pleasure is over, well that means that the relationship needs to end. And we just have a couple more comparisons. And interestingly enough, instead of being primarily citizens, 
were not necessarily citizens anymore. Being a primarily a citizen has been replaced by something that is much more convenient. We're primarily consumers. And there's even laws about consuming. Consuming responsibly. Consuming sustainably. Consuming, have you heard about chocolate says this is ethical chocolate? Okay, ethical chocolate, ethical coffee is consuming ethically, but nonetheless, consuming. So does this echo in any of your experiences? Do you, do you see this? I think it's quite interesting. We're living in this world right now, and this is the world that we're called to evangelize. This is the world that we're called to uh, to be vectors of unity, and we see how much the cards are so they stack against us, but it's not to lose hope, it's just to see what we're dealing with, because that's one of the great tactics of defeating our adversary, is to unveil his game, to see what we're looking at. And so, what is the result, is that in this most part of the world, we're to be, now hopefully this, no, look, in the modern world there was the sense of sacrifice and living up for a better tomorrow, but what we have, it's replaced by the pursuit of pleasure now. So tomorrow doesn't matter as much. It's now that's important. Now. And so there's not that sense of being turned towards a better future. It's turned to maximizing what I get out of it right now. And so how can you, if you're right to maximize right now, how can you have the idea of having a family, settling down, uh, sacrificing, and we see this in our Western world. Families, when they are very few children, there's, there's a whole change in demographics. There's a whole that is a, that is a result. So what is the result of this postmodern world? We must always be on the move. Because to stay still is not good. Always must change. You ever notice you know, change of hair, change of face? I remember one time someone who had these beautiful brown eyes. All of a sudden I see this person and her eyes are green. It's like, what happened? <laughs> and it was scary because you could see she left the wrong behind the green. It's like, what? Lee? Uh, are you the same person? You know, it was just, it's, it's very, I don't know, I don't know, say eyes are the limits of the soul, but when you change the colors of your eyes, it's like, whoa, what in the world happened? So always changing. You know, a pattern to make a change. And you see this on Facebook. Interestingly enough, the necessity of changing. If you look on all the different social media, the way they sort of succeed is to stand out, to be different, to be odd, to be um, inventive, innovative. It's so different from what I expect. I used to live in Siberia. I was living there for a year and a half. It was just after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1995. And I remember I was on the trolley bus. And I was talking, I mean, as an American, I talked so well, and I was talking, and the people with my group from Russia said, shh, 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 said, why do you have to be quiet? They said, you don't know who's listening. I said, I don't care who's listening, but they did. In every group of people, there's always one mole for the Communist Party. They always do it. There's always one person who is the ear of the Communist Party. So if I'm working like in the sacristy here, where they wouldn't have sacristies in Wicked, what did they do? They changed the Jesuit Church, the Church of St. Ignatius of Loyola in Irkutsk, no, in Illinois. They changed it into the Museum of Atheism. Can you imagine? They changed the church into the Museum of Atheism. So suppose so I'm working in the Museum of Atheism. Well, all five of us are working there. One of them is the Communist Party tattletale person. And you knew that. So you have to be careful. Everywhere you went, you have to be careful what you said and what you did. So the main goal in Soviet society was to blend in. Everyone wore drab, gray clothing. You would never want to wear like a red hat or a bright blue or anything. You wanted to blend in because to stick out could be dead. How different it is in our most modern world, the idea is to stand out, to be different. So you see how much there's been a shift. On that element, I can't say that the blending in thing was necessarily a good thing, but it is very stark on all the differences. But always changing, always moving, the duty, always to be happy. But without asking, 
one of the most important questions of where are we going? So just sort of like this flight forward in a pursuit of pleasure, always is changing, no confrontation, just consensus. You have your rules, I have mine. We will, we will not bother each other. So there's no common grounds for unity. The only unity is to pursue each person's desires. So that is sort of like the modern world that we are living in right now, the postmodern world. And so I think that's important for us to see that this is the context that we're up against. And now let's move on and see what the response is. You have to about Gnosticism and Pelagianism, so we got to get into this. We have two spiritual faculties that distinguish us from all other beings. Our capacity to know the truth, which is called the intelligence. And we have also the ability to be drawn to what is good and to decide the function of what we have discovered is good, which is the will. So remember that the intelligence, the capacity to know the truth, and the will to be drawn to the good and to, desire, to decide things in function of what is good. So in Pope Francis's episode exhortation, we're going to look into two threats to our intelligence and to our will. So God obtained and exalted today on the call to holiness in today's world. Beautiful document that I also read this summer at the Pontifical Institute at the University of Mexico City. So what does Pope Francis warn us against? He says that there are a couple of things that we need to know. There is the prevalence of what is called Gnosticism. And he will say that Gnosticism is the warping of the intolerance. And like how just falls in, we'll do that one more time, I think it's really cool. So Gnosticism, <laughs> is, it, it just falls on him. Gnosticism being the warping of the intelligence. Okay? So let's see what he has to say about Gnosticism. I tried to simplify this as much as possible. Okay, I'm going to read it because it's a little small. Gnosticism is one of the most sinister ideologies. Because while unduly exalting knowledge or a specific experience, it considers its own vision of reality to be perfect. For Gnosticism, by its very nature, seeks to domesticate the mystery whether the mystery of God and His grace or the mystery of others' lives. So to investigate the mystery, to take God and His transcendence and to bring it down to my level and say, this is what is, not that. God is in transcendence, no, I understand God. That's one of the elements of Gnosticism. That means that in some ways I'm equating my intelligence with the divine intelligence. That's what um, uh, Hegel did in some ways. He is God in his intelligence. So, this question of Gnosticism, and so the book goes on. When somebody has an answer for every question, and that's what science wants to have, it wants to have an answer to every question. It wants to even have an answer to the human mind, to try to discover what the human mind is and to duplicate the human mind. I don't know if you ever saw a movie called Transcendence, where Johnny Depp is downloaded into a computer mainframe. So interesting. And I said this to my sister Bob, who's a vice president of Google. I said, I watched this book called Transcendence. So, yeah. Yeah, Johnny Depp downloads himself into a computer mainframe. Her response was shocking. What did she say? She said, Michael, we can't do that yet. <laughs> They're working on it. God infinitely transcends us. He is full of surprises. We are not the ones to determine when and how we will encounter Him. The exact times and places of that encounter are not up to us. Someone who wants everything to be clear and sure presumes to control God's transcendence. So if we want everything to be sure and clear, which is what the Gnostics want. And we see this. What can we say? Gnosticism is sort of like 
and some of the scientific mindset. I'm not anything against science, but when it wants to dominate the mystery of God, then there's a problem. Science is great as long as it realizes that there are things that transcend science's capacity to know. That there's that humility of realizing that, okay, God is transcendent, we're not going to be able to go there. But when science wants to dominate life, dominate death, there is a problem. And so, does everybody have an answer for every question? That's what science would like to have, is to have an answer for every question. And I'm going to just look at this one last one before I make another comment, which I think is a very interesting observation that he says. God is mysteriously present in the life of every person. Even when someone's life appears completely wrecked, even when we see it devastated by vices or addictions, God is present there. If we let ourselves be guided by the Spirit rather than our own preconceptions, we can and must try to find the Lord in every human life. This is part of the mystery that agnostic mentality cannot accept since it is beyond its control. So there's the desire of controlling the mystery of God and everything being sure and certain. If I require everything to be sure and certain, then I'm denying the path of faith. Because in the path of faith, yes, it is sure. I do know that God exists, that is sure. But I am not certain of my path. My path ultimately is to God. But the path of faith is a path that requires trust, abandoning, and realizing that I am not God. Whereas the Gnostic mentality wants to, in some ways, take the place of God, make everything sure and certain, be the judge of life that is worth living or not. God is mysteriously present in the life of every person. A Gnostic mentality will say, okay, this life is worth being aborted. This life is worth being terminated. I was in the Netherlands in April, and I was visiting our house, we have a house, two houses in the Netherlands, and the brother who is now the superior in Laredo, who I named to take my place, is from the Netherlands, so I went to visit his family. And his aunt works in an old person's home. And she said, oh yes, Sharon, a lovely person, she's suffering quite a lot, it's been quite difficult for her. This was on Tuesday. She said, yeah, sure, she's so much. It's been hard for her. She's dying on Thursday at 3 o'clock. I said, what? It's not that she's making a dentist appointment at 3 o'clock. She's dying at 3 o'clock in her place. How can that be? I mean, do the doctors, I mean, like, they can predict when a person's going to be born or when they're going to give birth? Is it like, they know she's going to die at that time? Oh, no, no, she made an appointment. Yeah, to die. In Netherlands, euthanasia is completely acceptable. And what do they call it? It's called the right to die with dignity. Isn't that a terrible euphemism? What do they call abortion? They call it just a procedure for promoting women's health. That's what they call abortion as well. So these euphemisms, they take away the stark reality. Euthanasia is a person committing suicide. It's an assisted suicide. And what the person must do is it must be the person himself who wants to know that they'll open up the valve that will make the lethal liquid go into their veins. So this 95, 96 year old woman has to open up the valve when she dies. Imagine when abortion became legal, imagine the pressure that that put on pregnant women from their parents. Oh, man, you know, Susie, our family reputation, you've got to get an abortion. You can't be this close. If you love us, you get an abortion. Or the boyfriend, or anyone else. So that law rendered the pregnant woman extremely vulnerable. Terribly vulnerable, with its horrible social pressure on her to abort. In the same way that law permitted euthanasia, you're 96, well, oh, mom, you know, You've been in this old folks home for quite a long time, and you know, it's getting a little expensive for us. And you don't seem all that happy. It's 
So, you know, the doctor did say he could come by next week and he could just let like, finish it all off. But don't you think that'd be a good thing to do, Mom? Wouldn't that be the right thing to do? I mean, you do love us, you don't want us to have to watch you suffer and have you. That's sort of what happens. So, even when someone's life appears completely wrecked, God is present there. And it's not for us to determine when we will meet God. And that's the thing I think is terrible. This is going to work. Yeah. Uh, we're not the ones to determine when and how we will encounter God. The exact time and place of that encounter are not up to us. Someone who wants everything to be clear and sure presumes to God, control God's transcendence. And this is what we're looking at in this Gnostic heresy that is predominating a lot of our politics and decision making. It's the idea that we and our intelligence are in some way smarter than God. God doesn't know that this life is not worth living, so we're going to help him out. We're going to facilitate him. So that's one of the reasons that Pope Francis is putting us, is making us aware. And where did agnosticism start off? The same power that the Gnostics attributed to the intellect 
Pelagians now began to journey to the human will, to personal effort. Now it was not intelligence that took the place of mystery and grace, but our human will. And it was forgotten that everything depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who shows mercy, and that he first loved us. And so by this heresy, the Pelagian error, there's the refusal of God's mercy. There's the refusal of God being the first one to love us. And there's the affirmation that no, it's us that love God and us that work to attain God by our own grit, our own effort. Now I'm not saying that our path to eternal life does not require grit and effort, but what we're saying is that who moves first? It's not us. It's God who invites us to share His eternal life. And so this uh, Pelagian error is a refusal finally of God's mercy, of God's clemency. And it makes God out to be just some sort of neutral character who doesn't really care about us, and we're just sort of like in this sort of game, and some of us will win and some of us will lose. And so we better make sure that we win by our own human efforts, by our own way of exerting ourselves. And so these two heresies have been very, very strongly embedded in our, in our sort of psyche. He reminds us that in the second set of orange, nothing human can demand, merit, or buy the gift of divine grace. And that all cooperation with it is a prior gift of that same grace. Even the desire to be cleansed comes about in us to the outpouring and working of the Holy Spirit. So even the desire that we have to want to be holy is because grace has inspired that holy desire in our hearts. We'll look at that a little bit more this afternoon. But there is this movement. God is the first one to move towards us. It's not us who move first towards God. And that's where the major Pelagian error is. We are receivers of God's loving initiative in a sacrificial love through covenant. It's not us who say, hey God, you want to enter into covenant with me? No. It's God who moves first and invites us in. And furthermore, Knowing that attaining eternal life is difficult, he offers us his help, which is what we call grace. And the Pelagian there is that we don't need help. We can do it on our own. So that pours into the Gnostic error because it's through our intelligence going to make this world into what we need it to be. And we will dominate the world. We will dominate our path to eternal life, to salvation. So let's hear what St. Paul has to say. Who could read that for us? So I said, it's so nice to be here. Please. Yeah. 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 And so we can ask, 
is we see the practice of the Catholic Church. The gift of grace surpasses the power of human intellect and will. That with regard to God, there is no strict right to any merit on the part of man. Between God and us, there is an immeasurable inequality. And the Gnostic heresy does not want to accept that. And the Pelagian era enters into that as well. So we see that there's these two areas of what our spiritual faculties, our intelligence, and our will. And we're going to see in the afternoon why that is so important with regard to our faith walk. So this is the context in which we are called to unity. So let's let St. Paul speak to us one more time. Or maybe he'll speak a couple of times. We'd like to read this. Please go ahead. So, our call to unity is not a me or you plan, it's the plan for God. And He has made known to us this desire of His will. And how does this call of unity come about? By allowing ourselves to be united in Christ, completely united in Him. And so that's what we can ask for. Now, we're not going to go into the Unum Seed because time has, uh, has escaped for us. But one thing I would like to show and see, John Paul II's encyclical, Unum Seed, which means May 81, is he talks about, uh, well, let's look at the courageous witness of so many martyrs of our century gives due vigor to the call to unity. These brothers and sisters of ours united in the selfless offering of their lives for the kingdom of God are the most powerful proof that every fact of division can be transcended and overcome in the total gift of self for the sake of the gospel. So this is something we have to remember when we think about all these challenges towards unity. Every factor of division can be transcended and overcome. And every martyr is a, is a sign of that. I was in Brazil just these last couple weeks, and last Sunday we read a prayer for the canonization of Blessed Nivalda. And Blessed Nivalda was working in a very place where I said, Mass for the Missionaries of Charity, but in another place where there was a sister named Sister Erl, uh, Sister Dulce. Sister Dulce, who is a Canaanite saint from Salvador by the Brazil. She was working in her community, and she was doing something in the street on Good Friday where she was assassinated. She was martyred for her faith. And so we see that through her gift of self, through her witness, and the witness of all the martyrs, we have this proof that division and every factor of being separated can be overcome by the gift of self, that gift of showing that there is an overwhelming transcendent love that is calling us beyond every division, every opposition, every obstacle. And one of the most important things that we need to look at is the cross. The Gnostics, the Pelagians, do not want to recognize the salvific quality of the cross. An anti-Christian outlook seeks to minimize the cross, to empty it of its meaning, and to deny that it is in it man has the source of new life. It claims that the cross is unable to provide either vision or hope. Man says it's nothing but an earthly being who must live as if God did not exist. I believe that's one of the most sinister defects of these two heresies in this call to holiness is that our society, our post-modern society, 
wants us to live as though God did not exist. Wants us to live as though our, our city is born on earth and not in heaven. Wants us to live as though the only thing that matters is the here and now, the future is not important. Wants us to live as though there is no one who's called Jesus who says he's the truth. Every truth is relative. Wants us to live on the level of emotions and not of our intelligence. And wants us to live in sort of a certain complacency of consensus and transparency. And there's no one that plays in that intimate life of me with God. So St. Paul says, Brothers and sisters, strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind, live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. And he says in Romans, Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. And then in Ephesians, there is one body and one spirit. Just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. And so with this beautiful, these beautiful words from St. Paul, we come in somebody's full circle. We start off with that looking at Holy Scripture that calls us to unity. We are able to see how important unity is for our own Christian walk, how important it is for our own Christian uh, witness. We are able to look at the challenges to that unity in this post-pandemic, post-modern world. And we come back, we looked at two great obstacles, the Pelagians, the Gnostic pair, the two heresies that, Saint, that Pope Francis puts forth in his encyclical, in his apostolic exhortation. And we come back to the Holy Scripture that calls us to unity. So we saw the shift of the modern to the postmodern world, the effects of the pandemic, the renewed presence of old heresy of Gnosticism, the weak work in the mind, pervading belief that, that the will can of its own efforts attain eternal life. And so what we're called all the more to is to unity through Pope John Paul II's encyclical, maybe in one who whom him seek. The call to holiness by Pope Francis and our response. And what is our response? It asks for the grace of personal holiness. Ask for the grace of personal holiness. We can ask for the grace of personal holiness as we pursue our mission. And that will be not tomorrow's topic, but this afternoon's topic. The pursuit of holiness and ask for that as a grace of this mission. Let's stop, close off with a prayer, and we'll have a time of Q&A. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world of God, and Take the person where they're at. 
Don't take more than that, but try to join the word of God. What really moves you in your life? What are things that you really attach importance to? Hey, that's interesting. I attach importance to that as well. This is what I attach importance to that. What's your reason? And try to see where you can find, build common ground. That's the most important thing. Don't say, you know, uh, of course you would say that people almost say, well, what you're doing is a sin. Well, that's not going to get very far, you know? <laughs> Is it okay to ask a question about your first love? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> so, in the prayer of Saint uh, Ignatius, um, the phrase of the prayer to um, love the blood of Christ in me, and could you speak to that and how that relates to our inability to partake of the cup during Mass, during COVID? Oh, okay. Well, when you receive the body of Christ in the Eucharist, you receive the blood of Christ by what's called concomitants. So you're receiving holy Christ. You're not receiving it under the species of the precious blood, but you're receiving Christ's body, blood, soul, so you receive the total Christ. That's our Catholic belief. So the fact that you're not receiving Christ in the Eucharist does not in any way, uh, and not receiving Christ in the blessed precious blood does not in any way deny me uh, to receive the total Christ. So we have to be clear about that. But the question of uh, blood of Christ in Hebrew, that's very interesting to ask the question because I translated the Saint Ignatius of Loyal Prayer, and I translated it to Lithuanian by someone who did it in a very liberal way, and it wasn't the official translation. And it really was uh, you know, blood of Christ to make me drunk, you know, in Hebrew, and that's what the Hebrew is, you're drunk. Um, and so, why would the Saint Ignatius ask that? That's the question I would think would be interesting. Why would we want to be in either with the blood of Christ? Well, the blood of Christ, I mean, I'm just thinking out loud, so you can have your own reflection on that as well. But we say that the, the Holy Spirit is poured out into our hearts. You know, hope does not deceive us because the Holy Spirit is poured out into our hearts in Romans 4. Uh, and so, also, Christ's blood is poured out. And if the Holy Spirit is poured into our hearts, Christ's blood is poured out, it's poured out in abundance. And it's a sign of Christ's love for me. And we don't say that his body is poured out, his blood is poured out. And that abundance of blood poured out for me is a sign of his overwhelming, uh, in some ways, I say this with quotes, um, inebriated love for me, to use St. Ignatius' word. And so, the blood of Christ can be breaking with the love of the Holy Spirit that is poured into my heart. That's what I would say. Uh, and the fact of not being able to partake of the precious blood of drinking from the chalice from the time of COVID would, in some ways, be a means of increasing my desire for what I will be able to receive again, the precious blood. I love hearing communion of my intention, the blood and body of Christ. I think it's a very beautiful way of receiving uh, the Eucharist, and also because of my experience in the Eastern Catholic Church, you always receive my attention on a spoon. And so, uh, I think that to have that desire of receiving Christ's blood is something that can be increased, augmented during that time of being deprived of it. But inebriating me is a way of letting myself be inebriated by the presence of the Holy Spirit in my heart constantly.
decision to limit the traditional Latin mass, and I know a lot of Catholics, I have, I'm, you know, I took the opportunity during COVID to go to some up in Houston at the Roman parish that was available. But what I'm saying is that I've seen a lot of pain on social media with Catholics that I've become friends with throughout the world about the changes uh, or the limiting of the traditional Latin mass. And I just think because uh, of the music has changed, we don't have the, the, the communion rails that, you know, we, we come away. And I think that I've been telling, I've told them the other way, I've been telling a lot more traditional in my way of thinking. And my thing, and my thoughts are, I guess my question is, by limiting the transcendent feeling of it, something bigger than us, mass is bigger than us, the tabernacle being on the altar, the, the beautiful music, you know, maybe even the Latin that we didn't understand, and I think we've come to the, the lady, we reduced it to lay terms, the mass and our evangelization to a certain extent, to lay terms, and I think, and we've seen many, many Catholics fall away, because, and I feel that that I have a concern that we keep going the way to reduce the transcendent. And, um, and, I, and I think that we're losing people because of that and, and we're falling away from that desire. This is not about us, this is all about them. Yeah, this is all about the people. So anyway, again, it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a giant topic you may not, but I just think if you could offer any any comments about that? We have to understand the Holy Spirit is always guiding the church. And there's a necessity. We're going to stop with that question because if I keep going on with more questions, I'm not going to make it back. <laughs> I'll have to start at 1.30 and not 1 o'clock. So we're going to have to stop with that question just so you know. Um, and I think that we have to, there's a question of trust. There could be a question of anger. I know some people are quite angry with what was said. Also, I think that uh, the Holy Spirit will have His way, and that's something we have to realize. The Holy Spirit will have His way, and we will need to become docile always to the Holy Spirit, and that's not easy to do, because you can see that maybe some decisions or some words even could be of the Holy Father, could like say, What's, why is He saying that? That makes me confused or I don't understand. And, okay, who is really in charge of the church? Is it the Holy Father or is it the Holy Spirit? And so we have to understand that, okay, the Holy Spirit has been leading the church for a lot longer than I've been on this planet. And he's led the church through thick and thin, through Pelagian heresies, the Gnostic heresies, through the Arian heresy, the, the Nestorius heresy, all different kinds of heresies. And the church has been triumphant. And we've gone through even a time when there were what were called anti popes, where there were two popes. Uh, and so the church has been victorious. And we have to realize, okay, the church, even though there might be holes in the boat, the church is taking in the water, we still need to remain in the boat. And that's the most important thing to remain in the boat. We can be vocal, we can say what we think, but in the end, at the end of the day, we just remain in the boat. And that's what I would say. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, ever shall be, the world of God, and the